Hey, good morning, Awakening Church. Great to see you. Welcome. If you're new, my name's Ryan. We're thrilled to have you join us this morning. And uh, this morning we're kicking off a brand new series called The Habit of Grace. And it's really um, personal to me. I'll share in just a second because this isn't just simply something, you know, hey, we were teaching through the Sermon on the Mount. This is what I feel like God's been teaching me the last six months. Uh, if you were to sit down with me, we're going to have a cup of coffee and just hang out. And you ask, hey, what, what has God been teaching you? By the way, great question with one another. I ask, hey, what are you learning lately? This sermon actually is what I, God's been working in and uh, on my life. And so I'm excited to share with you that. Before we dive in, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this moment to gather, to meet with you, to worship, and to fix our eyes on you. I ask that you would speak, and you would move, and you would work right now. You would get me out of the way, that my words would be your words, that your people would meet with you in a way that just is deep, uh, soul-shaping, that would change tomorrow and the days after. So we invite you to have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, 2019, that's the year we're currently in, has actually been a very difficult year for me in regards to my health. Uh, some of you know it, I've shared a few things in sermons, but it's been one of the weirdest, oddest years. I've spent more time in urgent care or doctor's offices than I have in the previous decade. No lie. We have paid for insurance, never used it this year, spent thousands of dollars already uh, through all sorts of tests and things. It's been, it's been an odd, odd year. It all began January 21st, which is the day before my birthday. By the way, you can write that down, January 22nd, my birthday, Ryan's birthday. Shoot me a, you know, a text or something. Um, you're like, I don't have your phone number. We'll figure that out later. But uh, we, we're moving into our new offices next door. I was really excited about that. And the painters are over there. And, and so there was this hanging cabinet that needed to be taken down in order that we get the balls and nobody was around to do it. I'm like, I'll run over and do it by myself. Mistake number one. Mistake number two is for some odd reason, I was in a deep, deep hurry. It makes no sense. I could have taken my time. And I show up, I'm trying to get this thing, and through all my own just kind of missteps, I had this about 100-pound cabinet fall on top of me and hit me square in the back of the head. I mean, I've never been knocked so hard in my entire life in my head. I step back. It's like one of those you're just like reeling from. You're like, oh, my gosh, I'm not sure. Am I okay? Is this going to happen? I, you know, I had a big old mound on the back of my head, a little bit of blood, all those sort of things. I was like, I got to finish the job. So I still took the cabinet down after that. I come back and my wife's like, you need to go to the emergency room. I'm like, no, I'm good. <laughs> Seriously, this is what I said. I said, I already went through my own concussion protocol. <laughs> Idiot. No, you can't, by the way, just so you know, you can't do your own concussion protocol. That's like, you know, 101. And she's like, okay, no, we talked to our friend who knows a lot about it. You should really go, I'm fine, I'm fine. So the entire week, I'm doing all the things that are really bad when you have a concussion. I'm getting worse, feeling terrible. And it wasn't until Friday, it was about four days later, that I'm like, Jenny, I need to go to the doctor. I don't know. And she's like, yeah, I've been telling you that for four days. And go to the doctor, and they're like, yeah. Um, you have a concussion. I said, fantastic. What do I do? Nothing. Okay. I, you don't understand. I'm a pastor. I teach. Like, you can't read. Okay. You can't be on screens. Be in dark room. See, the, the symptoms of a concussion is like uh, lights really are painful. Noise. Lots of noise is painful. You have head fog, blurry vision. I had ringing in this ear. I couldn't see as at all. Like my head just hurt. When I concentrate, it just was so painful. 
And you're like, so church was kind of hard, you know? It's like, it's all of those sort of things, right? And a sermon was some of the most painful things I've done this last spring. Like, one of my great joys uh, is to be able to prepare and do this. Uh, and I was like, I can't do that. It's a hard, it was just like hurt. And so do nothing in a couple weeks. I'm like, well, I can't. We just, we we're launching this series, Controversial Jesus. And, and so what you probably have noticed is this spring, I actually have taught far less than I normally would because I just haven't been able to. So in concussion number one, about two weeks later, I'm feeling a lot better, starting to engage in activities way sooner than I should be. So right at, about a month after, this happens in one weekend. On Saturday, my son's skateboarding. He's, sk- he's like, you know, flying down this hill. He gets little speed wobbles, hits a rock, and he's just falling like this, Superman style, and hits his wrist, and he's in a lot of pain. And we're like, well, this, this is how cheap I am. The emergency room's kind of expensive. Urgent care is open on Monday. It might be a sprain. It might be, you know, we'll see. Let's just see how it is. And we, you know, wrap it up in ice and all those sort of things. And, um, the very next day, I'm playing basketball, which I shouldn't have been at all. That's dumb. Not because it's dumb, just because I was four weeks away from a concussion. And then Roland, who you saw up here earlier, broke my nose playing basketball. It's amazing he still has a job. <laughs> no, he felt terrible about it. But we're, we're playing, and I'm driving, and he had a guy, like, pick him from behind, and his arm just flung forward, and I caught his forearm right across my nose, and the nose just went like that, and blood everywhere. I mean, it just looked like a crime scene. Uh, my boys are like, they're there, they're like, oh my gosh, is that okay? I'm like, it's fine. I've actually broken this nose four times. It's not a big deal. Roland made it straighter, too, I believe. So that Monday... My son and I are in urgent care together. (laughs) One for his wrist, me for my nose, and now second concussion. The ladies were sweet. They're like, oh, this is so precious, father and son together. I'm like, this is not precious (laughs) at all. And because it was my second so close to the first, man, my head spun. I, I was really not doing well. I was, I was keyed up to preach that next Sunday, and I, I got through it, and I was like, I can't do it anymore. Like, it hurt. And my dad stepped in, and Chris stepped in to preach, which I'm so grateful for to have them uh, in my life. And I literally spent days in a dark room. I, I mean, I, you, I just feel for my wife and my kids. Like, it's been one of those seasons where, like, they've had to be so quiet. Dad's MIA. I'm just kind of, like, in a fog. And, like, the noise and the light, like, everything hurts so bad. I, and my kids on their Father's Day card wrote, and please be safe, Daddy. Don't get hurt anymore. Like, every single one of them independently, I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> concussion number three. Okay, so... In between concussion number two and concussion number three, okay, I broke my big toe. And I wish I had a good story for this one. There's an intruder in our house. I did this, like, drop kick. His face looks worse than my toe. You know the story. Okay, you don't. My story is this. I was kicking a ball for my dog, and I broke my big toe. How lame of a story is that? Literally, no lie. I'm walking out. I, I was concussed, so I, I'll blame that. There's a tennis ball. My dog, Finley, sweet little labradoodle. I was like, I'm going to kick this ball so she can chase it. And I go as hard as I can, completely miss the ball. I'm wearing shoes just like this. Drive my toe into the cement. And I heard the cracking. I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is not good. I pull out my shoe. I've never had this experience. I'm wearing a shoe, mind you, with all this, and my foot's just bleeding. It's just gone. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Go the next day to urgent care. By then, they have a coffee mug with my name on it. (laughs) Sure enough, broke my toe. All the while, I'm supposed to be training for this three-day stage 
uh, mountain bike race that I'm doing with my buddy for his 50th birthday in South Africa that was coming up at the end of April, beginning of May. Well, two concussions, you're not allowed to exercise, um, and then I broke my toe, and it really made cycling hard with a broken big toe, and so I'm just reduced to not being able to do anything that I love, any of the things that refresh you. You know, I, you know it was one of the, it's been one of those seasons that's been so hard. Like, I love playing basketball. I love going for runs. I love playing with my kids. They're like, Dad, can you play? I'm like, sorry, I can't. I, I love studying and reading and writing and haven't been able to do those sort of things. Just stripped back all those things. Go to South Africa and uh, brilliant time, you know, got to preach at the church out there. It was so fun and experienced so many of my friends' world as they're South African. And then go on this bike race and the first day is fantastic. It's a lot of fun. Hurt a little bit, but nothing bad. The second day I got going down this hill way too fast and then I hit this big ditch. And the bike went that way. And I went this way, and I'm flying in my, the air, thinking to myself, just don't hit your head, just don't hit your head. I land on my hip, hit my shoulder, and then my head just whiplashes to the ground. Concussion number three. In five months. I get up, I dust myself off. I'm really not too badly injured overall. I try to ride some more, and my buddy, uh, partner, he's... He said, you know what, you're not, you're not quite right. We need to call, you know, the paramedics. And they go through the whole thing, and sure enough, concussed. And so it's been kind of a weird spring. It's been really hard, if I'm honest. Incredibly frustrating. Um, like, this series I've been really excited about, and every time I've sat down to write it, my eyes have been completely blurred out. My head hurts, and I just feel like, man, I can't go on. There's been one verse that I've clung to through the last five months. It's this sustaining anchor verse that I keep going back to. I don't know if you have any of those like that in your life where you're just like, man, I am claiming this truth, and I'm, I'm not just claiming it, I'm clinging to it. Because that's all I got. I can't, I can't do this on my own. And, and if you were to look at my journals and just begin to read through them, you would, you would see this written down maybe a hundred times. And for some mornings and sometimes, it's the only thing that I can write. It comes out of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, where God is speaking to the Apostle Paul in an incredibly hard time where he's disappointed and he's not seen, um, seen the, the trial pass. And God says this, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In my journal, you'll see that over and over. Like, just, God, your grace today is sufficient for me. And your power is made perfect in weakness. I don't have a clue how I'm going to make it through this meeting. I don't have a clue how I'm going to be able to write a sermon this week. I don't have a clue how I'm going to make it through a Sunday. But, but I'm trusting, I'm confident that your word will never fail, that your promises are true and trustworthy. And so in this moment, your grace is sufficient because I'm insufficient. I got nothing. I'm empty. I'm broken. I'm broken down. And your power... If it's perfected or, or made strong, it, man, I'm weak. I, I'm really, really weak. So you have great opportunity for power. And I've been watching God do something in me and through me that he could not do any other ways. The lessons that I've been learning this spring. The big idea for this series is simply this. Grace is more than just an event to be experienced. We, we get this. Grace is this event, this thing that happens. But grace is a habit to be embraced. 
Grace is more than an event to be experienced, this moment where you're given grace. We understand that. Like somebody gave you grace, so you're imparted grace. But grace is so much more than that. Grace is, grace is a habit to be embraced in your daily life. And I think we, when we think of grace in the church as followers of Jesus, we think of it more, maybe you wouldn't use this word, but more as an event. Meaning like uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, for, by, uh, uh, for the grace of God, sorry, I, I saw my wife back there. She, no, it's not my wife. Never mind. Different. It looked like my wife. Totally distracted. I was like, oh, I thought she took the kids away and now she's back. All right. I'm concussed, guys. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved. And this not of yourself, it is a work of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This moment of experiencing grace, like just poured out on you, and the moment you're saved, you're saved by grace, that is that event, and that is so powerful and so beautiful and wonderful, but grace is more than that. It is also this habit we're invited into. Grace is this habit. It's this daily empowered by grace. This is what the Apostle Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians verse 12. It's this empowerment of God's grace in your life. Like, he wants you not to just be saved by grace, but be daily empowered by grace. Like, you're walking in grace. The Apostle Paul and many writers throughout the New Testament would say, may the grace of God be with you. Like, you're traveling companions together together with you. So what is grace? Well, one definition for grace is grace is getting what we do not deserve. This is the understanding of grace as an event. It's getting what you do not deserve, whereas mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Grace is getting what we do not deserve. Grace is getting salvation. Grace is being fully and completely forgiven and loved. Grace is that you were moved out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son he loves, that you are adopted, that you are redeemed, that every spiritual blessing uh, in the heavens is yours in Christ. That is grace poured out on you the moment you become saved. And mercy is not getting what you do deserve, not getting punishment, not getting, um, not getting in, you know, condemnation. And that's where we see this saved by grace, and it is powerful, and it's wonderful, but it's deeper, and it's richer, and it's daily. See, I love how Dallas Willard defines grace. He defines it this way. Grace is God acting in our life to do what we cannot do on our own. Let me say it again. Grace is God acting in our life. He's active to do uh, what we cannot do on our own. That God is actively at work in you for you to accomplish and become who you could never be on your own. Let me give you an illustration. You remember science fair projects? Yeah. You remember that kid that always showed up? If you were that kid, don't worry about it. But that kid that always showed up that clearly his parents helped him or helped her with the project. You showed up and you're like, okay, this is a volcano and it doesn't look much like a volcano. But I tell you, if I do this, it goes here. And he shows up and it's like this big old built out thing. You know, it's a spaceship that actually goes to the moon. You're like, no, there's no way. That kid couldn't find his way out of a paper bag. He... Still can't figure out how to tie his shoes. And somehow he shows up with this amazing thing and is like, hello. That's grace. That's a parent acting in that kid's life to be able to do what they could not do on their own. And God says, I want to do that for you. I want to do that for you. I am actively, daily wanting to empower you by my grace to help you to become and to do what you could not do on your own. And this is the daily empowered by grace. And so the question is, how do we begin to embrace this habit of grace? How do we begin to live that out? In our passage in 2 Corinthians 12, I want to give you just three words that will help us develop this habit of grace in our lives. Uh, The first word's pain. 
And you're like, awesome. Not like really the first word you want to hear. Promise and then paradox. The Apostle Paul is going to say, actually, the thorn in my flesh, this painful reality is the pathway or the conditions upon which it moves me to be able to be postured to experience the grace of God. Because in and of myself, without it, I will be self-sufficient. You know, if you have your Bibles and you can see, uh, and here it says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's in, in red. It's God's word to the Apostle Paul. But this wasn't the answer to prayer that Paul was asking for. The context of this passage is uh, Paul is having a rough time with this church in Corinth. They're pretty braggadocious. They're prideful. They're going like, who are you even? Like, you planted us. You started this thing. But we, we have some of these other people. And so he's defending his apostleship and leadership. And, and in it, he talks about this experience he had. He had this incredible experience uh, with God that was so powerful and wonderful and then it says this in verse 7, Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, because I've seen things just so wonderful and amazing, um, I was given a thorn in my flesh. That word thorn is literally a stake. Like painful. Not, not just like this little thorn, like painful consuming in my flesh. A messenger of Satan to torment me. Now notice what Paul does. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. What the Apostle Paul wanted God to do for him was to take away the pain. And what God wanted to do was to uh, transform his understanding of the pain. We, we want to be delivered from... And for some, you're in a place and going through something where God actually wants to shift your perspective because if, he, if you like, get delivered out of it, you will never experience the empowering presence and grace of God in your life. This thorn, many people have wrestled with, like, what was this thorn in the flesh? Some think it's spiritual temptation, others opposition, persecution. Some have said maybe it was sexual temptation that Paul was going through or physical sickness or depression. Here's what we know. We don't know what it is. I'm glad it doesn't say. What we know is it's painful. What we know, Paul struggled and wrestled with God and pleaded. What we know is God didn't answer his prayer the way Paul wanted it to be answered. For some, this is an important moment for you because you've been praying and the way you think about life is like in, you have a very specific way that you want God to answer your prayer. And unless he shows up in that way, you will not be satisfied. And you've been praying and you've been looking at this and God's going, no, I have a different answer altogether. And you will be deeply disappointed with me if you are just clinging to your answer to the prayer. God's answer was different than Paul's answer. He didn't give Paul what he wanted. He gave Gave him what he needed most because he's his good, loving, perfect, heavenly father. Are you, did you walk in this moment with pain? Did you walk in this morning struggling? Did you walk in hurting? Have you been hit in the head three times? Figuratively, hopefully. God wants to use that in your life. God wants to not substitute the pain, but he wants to bring a transformation in your life through the pain. Philip Yancey in his book, Vanishing Grace, says this, true followers of Jesus distinguish themselves primarily by admitting failure and the need for help. Think about that. True followers of Jesus distinguish themselves not by having it all together, not by everything's perfect. Distinguish themselves primarily by admitting failure. I'm broken. I'm hurting. 
God, the sin in my life's just killing me. Man, this circumstance is overwhelming. That physical ailment that just, God, I wish it would go away, but it's not. It's just, it's just nagging. Admitting failure and the need for help. See, in our world, pain is something we like to push away. And God wants to use it to draw us close to him. We want to numb it out. And we'll do all sorts of things to, to numb or to avoid pain, right? And for some, it, your work is your endless pursuit to, uh, to avoid the internal pain. Maybe it's drink. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's media. Maybe it's the incessant need to travel, that you are trying to avoid pain. And God's going, no, I want to use that to draw you closer to me, to transform you. Notice that God doesn't give the Apostle Paul an explanation, but a promise. He says this, okay, the pathway, how do we begin to embrace this habit of grace? First, we have to, we have to be real about our pain. We have to go, okay, God, I need you. I need you. I need you. And then we get a promise from God. Notice the promise. God's grace is sufficient for you. That's his promise. That was his promise to Paul. That's his promise to you. I don't know what you're going through. God's grace, God's acting in our life to do what we cannot do on our own is sufficient, is more than enough for you. I don't know what the relationship issues are in your life. I don't know what the challenges are. I don't know what the the loneliness or the hurt or the heartache or the pain. God says, here's my promise. My grace. Sufficient for you. This is my promise to you. Like you can take it to the bank. And by the way, I've spent five months resting on that promise. Going, okay, God. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know what it's going to do. You got me into this. I'm trusting you'll see me through it. God, your grace right now in this moment, like my head hurts so bad and I have nothing to give. Would you give me grace? And all of a sudden I have clarity for the time I need it. Your grace is sufficient for me. You know, if you are got your Bibles, would you, you look right at verse 9 and it says but he said to me that's meaning God he said to me and just underline that word said in the Greek it's it's not in the past tense like something happened in the past it's in what's called the perfect tense and this is an incredible uh like emphasis the perfect tense is not the past action so much as it is such the present state of affairs resulting from the past actions. I'm sure you got that right away. That made total sense. Let me read it again. The emphasis of the perfect tense is not the past action. Not that he said then. So much as it is such, theology speak, but the present state of affairs resulting from the past action. The perfect tense is something that happened in the past that has ongoing effect. This is a moment where Paul met and heard from God, and it was that anchor moment he heard from him, and it carried with him day in and day out. He's like, today I'm walking by grace. He said to me, and it matters today just as much as it did back then. Like, I don't know if you've ever had that where you heard God speak to you, and it's that moment when you're like going, okay, that's not just fuel for today, that's fuel for my life. This is what it was for Paul. He said to me, he said to me, he said to me, his promises are true, and it's carrying me through. God's grace is sufficient for you. But notice what God didn't promise. Because we shift it, we twist it. God never promised this, by the way. God never promised that he would never give you more than you can handle. Have you heard that before? You're going through a hard time, you're going through stuff that's difficult and hard. Well, God, you know, someone, some well-meaning 
intended person says, well, God will never give you more than you can handle. Nuh-uh. Like, that's literally nowhere in the Bible. Nuh-uh. You'll get way more than you can handle in this life. His promise was his grace is sufficient for you through those areas when it's beyond your ability, beyond your sufficiency. Ephesians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is in this just declaration of who God is. And he says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we think or imagine. Like that's the God we're approaching. That's the grace he's dispensing You won't experience the God who is able until you have to trust him in the places where you're unable. See, we don't like that. That's what pain is producing in our life. God, your grace is sufficient for me. I'm overwhelmed by this situation. I'm overwhelmed by the challenges of my day. I'm overwhelmed by life. And what I know is now to him who's able, you are able and your grace is sufficient for this moment. I'm insufficient, but your grace is sufficient. And so I'm leaning in, I'm leaning in onto your strength. See, what will cause us to miss out on the sufficient grace of God is our own self-sufficiency. I got it handled, God. We'd never say it that way, but that's how we act. I can do it, and if I just try harder, work harder, put my head down, I am capable in and of myself. Part for me, and it's kind of weird to say this as a pastor, is part of the sin in my life is the sin of self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency isn't that you don't work hard. It's working hard apart from God at work. Self-sufficiency is I don't need God to do the work. There's been multiple times, even through the history of our church, where things have just been like spun out of control and it's over my head. And my first response (laughs) isn't to cling to God. It's just to put my head down and work harder and just... I can do it. I'm going to grit my teeth, and I just work harder. And you know what happens? I get burned out. Let me give you an example of pride at work in my life. This is embarrassing. I hate the word can't. Maybe some of you hate the word can't. You know, people who, you know, are on our staff team, they say, well, this can't be done. It's like an immediate challenge. Like, yeah, 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 it can. Don't tell me it can't be done. It, I know it can. You, we, we can do it. And like, no, it can't. Uh, a little example. A number of years ago, we had a birthday, and I wanted some new um, cornholes. I wanted this party outside, you know, playing the games. And a gal on our staff said, you know what? It's too late. We can't get cornhole. I said, well, what do you mean? I mean, Amazon Prime ships overnight. How can we not get cornhole? I mean, there's got to be a store within the, you know, you know, 20-mile radius that carries some cornholes. We could go get it. Like, in my head, this idea of can't, this is Friday, our service is on Sunday, and I was frustrated with that response. A godly response would have been like, you know what, it's not a big deal. We can deal with it later. We can talk about all these sort of things. Is cornhole really all that important? Probably not. However, that's not what I responded with. I responded with a prideful response. I am going to show you that it can be done and prove you wrong. So I searched online, searched around, and sure enough, I couldn't find any cornhole uh, games. And so I looked up the specifics on the line of how to make it went down to the hardware store it's a hundred degrees out me and miles are in the backyard chopping wood building cornholes for the next day a terrible use of my time by the way i show up with cornholes on my birthday you know these games i lay them out a little smirk it can be done by the way just because it can be done doesn't mean it should be done Self-sufficiency 
I can do it on my own. I don't need help. I'll prove you wrong. Will cause you to miss out on the sufficiency of God's grace. It's not that you don't work hard. We're going to talk about that next week. It is that you realize in and of yourself you can't, so you come to the God who can. In and of yourself you're not able, and so you come to the God who's able to do and to work in you what you are unable to do. And so in partnership with him, you're showing up, presenting something like, I don't really know how this is so great. Actually, I do. It's grace. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, But amazing. Like God got me into this. He saw me through this. And wow. And then you become a trophy of his grace as people look at your life. Word number one, pain. Word number two, promise. Word number three, paradox. You see, God's power is perfected in weakness. That word is God's power comes to full strength in weakness. I love how Philip Yancey in his book says it again. He says, like water, grace always flows downward. James would say it, that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The paradox is this. When I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. Notice how Paul finishes it out. He says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness. What? Paradox, perspective shift. In insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. Why? For when I am weak, then I'm strong. God's power is perfected or comes to full strength in our weakness. One theologian said it this way. Divine power finds its full scope and strength only in human weakness. The greater the Christian's acknowledged weakness, the more evident Christ's enabling strength. So this morning, this morning, are you, are you weak? Are you tired? Are you overwhelmed? Do you feel discouraged or defeated? Do you feel like you're hanging by a single thread? Are you struggling? Are you hurting? Is life difficult and overwhelming? Friends, I want to let you know, you, you may not have known this, but you're actually knocking on the door of grace. Like you're you're so close to the strength and power of God, you had no idea. And you're about to give up, you're about to give in, you're about to get out. You're like, I can't do it anymore. And it's in that acknowledgement and going, okay, God, I need you. I want you come just this moment. And you experience the daily empowerment of God's activity in your life. It's called grace. And he wants to meet you there. You are knocking on the door of grace, friend. The inverse is true for some this morning. Maybe you walked in feeling strong. I can handle it. I'm good. And I would caution you that perhaps you're weaker than you realize. Perhaps you're you're trailing, you're starting to travel and trail away from grace. Because embracing this daily empowerment of grace, acknowledging our pain, resting on the promises, and then leaning into the paradox. Okay, when I'm weak, I'm weak right now, you're strong. When I'm weak, you're strong. When I'm weak, you're strong. So what do I do with that? In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 5, 14. This is where I want to land the plane this morning for us as we respond to the Word of God. Verse 14 says this, 
Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Like, I don't know what perspective you have of God. You're like, man, I'm weak, and I'm weak because of my flesh. I'm weak because of sin. I'm weak because I'm broken and fallen, and like, God doesn't want me. And he says, no, 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 we have a high priest who's not unable to sympathize and empathize with your weakness. In fact, in Romans it says, where sin abounds, grace superabounds. Like God wants to just pour his grace on you. And what you thought was keeping you from him should be the marker of you running to him to experience his grace. Then he says this, let us then approach God's throne of grace. Isn't that good? What's the throne of God? Grace. Like God's known as the God of all grace. He sits on a throne of grace. And scriptures tell us that we have received grace upon grace. So run to him. Run to him. that we may receive mercy and find grace in your time of need. Are you needy? Are you weak? I know I am. You're knocking on the door of grace. So here's what I want to do. I want to actually run to the throne of grace right now in our service, leading us there. This is a exercise that we did during our sacred rhythms, a prayer of palms down and palms up. And this morning, would you just join me in running to the throne of grace in our time of need? Would you put your palms down on your knees just like this? Take a a breath. Palms down is symbolic of your desire to turn over any concerns you have to God. God, I, like, I just want to turn them over. Like, would you pray this prayer? Lord, I give you blank. What's the concerns? The desires? Lord, I give you my anger. Lord, I give you my anxiety. Lord, I give you my hurt and my pain. I give you my desire for healing and wholeness. I give you, God, I'm just weak and I'm broken and I got nothing in the tank and I just, I give it to you. Like, there's nothing to give. I'm so empty. So what can I give? I just, that's it. Would you just begin to give him your concerns? And if you shift your hands, palms up, symbolic of your desire to receive from the Lord. Like in this moment, you're like, I'm knocking on the door of grace because I'm weak and I'm in need. Lord, I'd like to receive divine power, your divine strength. God, I'd like to receive your love, your peace, your patience, your joy. Would you just begin to call out to your Savior, God, I need you. Pour out your love, your grace, your power, your strength. you to take just a moment of silence before God. Don't ask for anything. And simply allow the Lord to commune with you in love.